So I feel like we, at least I just heard like a lot of theory, let's call it, about what makes partnerships work. And, um, but sometimes it's helpful to hear bad stories too. Like what, you know, when it goes wrong, what goes wrong, what drives, what, what is the big driver? And hopefully going to your, I mean, this is gonna be a question for you, Josh. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. <laughs> but um, you know, I think you made one point that I, I wanna highlight if you can try to fit in, which is you know, the, the difference between um, kind of generalized knowledge mm -hmm. and just kind of a story. Um, and so, you know, is there any lesson that permeates through a sequence of failures that you think is an important lesson of what not to do um, with a story of, um, I told you this question in advance. Yeah. No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, so I think that, uh, I, I guess the, the aspect of the portfolio approach I think is very, um, that Susan was talking about it, it is something important. So I think it's very, a good thing not to do is to be very um, narrow in the problem you're gonna work on or the people you're gonna potentially bring to the table because then you're just unlikely to get a match um, up where both the academic is happy and uh, the partner is happy. So I think that is definitely a, uh, a possibility. The other th nice thing about the portfolio approach is that there's gonna be failure um, we talk about failure in different ways, but one of the big failures is that your champion within the institution or the partner goes away. Um, and, that, and that champion is so important um, to the success of the project. And you talk about like financial services firms, the big ones, they are intentionally moving these executives around. Um, and so you start with some, some executive working on something and then they get transferred to another area. A new executive comes in and says, hmm, well, if I take on this thing, if it's successful, it'll be viewed as that last guy's success, and if it fails, I'll be stuck with the baggage. So they generally kind of walk away. So the more you can have a number of irons in the fires and a number of things you're doing with one partner, the more likely you are to be successful, and you get the, the benefit of sort of spreading the, that relationship you developed over a number of different projects. So, do you want to add something? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. So, one other tension, which I think you guys um, kind of both talked a bit about, but I want to focus on, is the the tension of measuring impact, and the basic problem that. So, I'm going to just pose the problem, and then the question will be like, what do you think of that? Which is, you know, that as at least as I see the problem, is that it's easy to make poor claims, and so even well-intentioned people might be running a for-profit firm that needs to make money and is a, but is yet attracting money from an impact investing space. Maybe it's below market rate or maybe, maybe not, but you know, they are telling a social impact story. Um, and so there's often a tension there with the question that they're, you know, the claim they're making is a long-term claim mm -hmm. about long-term impact, it's about habit formation. It's something that by its very nature is long run. And that's the interest of the academic, but the, but, you know, but the, the problem is there's, there's kind of short run and maybe bad metrics that can be used that satisfy too many people. And so they can kind of raise the money they need off of bad metrics and so then there's an incentive problem. So that's it. That's my non-question question and so the question is what do you think of that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess that was a, in, the, um, in my for-profit, sector work, that's a huge problem because people get their, you know, you don't want to, you don't want your colleagues to not get their bonuses because the short-term metrics don't look good because you were investing in long-term impact. And so that was a constant tension um, when you would sort of say, all right, wouldn't it be better to do things this way, but it's going to look bad for, for three or six months. And actually, um, you know, that, that was a problem for Yahoo kind of on its way out that, you know, there were, it was always all they cared about was the next month and trying not to get acquired. And so they, they, you could see a lot of things went wrong, putting up more and more ads and other stuff that just was not, were not consistent with the long-term impact. So um, one of the things that I've tried to do out of that is really to, so you have, I think at that point you have to solve the whole problem. You have to get some of the key decision makers, whether it's higher upper executives or it's funders, um, you know, in my board positions, you know, really getting every, getting, making sure everybody agrees that this problem will not be solved by short-term metrics. So let's make sure everybody understands that the way you're being evaluated for this particular issue is a different metric. 
And, that, if, and if you didn't solve that, it was just very hard to get people to buy into doing the right thing. But the, on the plus side is that people really want to do the right thing. Like it's not fun to work for any kind of company when you know what you're doing is gaming this month's numbers. Like maybe it's, maybe it's exciting for a month to see them pop, but it's not a satisfying job. Um, and so it's, it's actually, you know, people can be, will be very motivated to go to some, to some effort to actually do the right thing. I think most people understand when they're not doing the right thing. I would just add, I think the, the problems even compounded when you're talking about social issues. So you take something like college completion, right? We don't really know if you're successful for, if it's a community college, two or three years, if it's a four-year institution, four to six years, and you're looking at things like, well, did we get students to fill out their financial aid form in a timely manner and get more financial aid? Because we know small amounts of money can cause people to drop out, or do you see completion from one year to the next? Um, so you're looking at these proximate measures, but it's hard to know. Um, and then if you think about, well, you want to have, an, you, you learn from the tech world, you want to have a, a fastly iterating feedback loop and problem, uh, you know, to, you try something, see if it works. And then you take a, talk, take a school year, right? So you're only being able to iterate maybe once a semester to once a year. It's a significant challenge. I'm very interested in something that Susan mentioned is as we gather more data along the spectrum of the outcomes, can, are there different statistical models or ways to figure out what's really predictive and, and what's not? Yeah. Yeah, and that's actually something that also comes up like in education and training as well. Like you might have lots and lots of data watching people engage in an application. And if you can just, you know, really make sure you understand what that means in terms of ultimate learning outcome, then you can iterate really quickly. But in, until you do that, you're not going to be able to. And that's one of the, the things in all of our collaborations we talk about. That's a long-term research project. It takes a lot of thought. So it's a great thing for the academics to go off and think about and can work on over a course of years as you get more data and so on to keep doing better and better at mapping, the making the short-term measures you're using to optimize represent the long-term impact. For what it's worth on that, I've always found there's like a, I mean, there's obviously win cases that overcome this, but you know, young organization, young firms are so young that they can't wait that long and the large organizations have the problem you mentioned where your, your champion moves. <laughs> it's not to say there's not success cases, lots of them, but that's... Well, do you have any, any tactics? Uh, no, just try to get incentives aligned. Um, that's the, <laughs> you know, that's the key is, you know, need the champion and keep incentives aligned. It's like, how to make sense for the for-profit firm um, um, at the end of the day. Um, what, um, um, your question to me now just completely sucked away the question I was about to ask you. Um, I know what it was. Um, so you, you, I think you both touched on an issue of intellectual freedom, which is um, in, in some cases, um, at least in my experience, more of a problem and sometimes everything is perfectly aligned. Um, what, um, you, know, you, know, the, you know, my favorite line I've ever heard from a company that I refuse to work with told me that they were totally happy to give me intellectual freedom, but they were just going to decide that later. Um, <laughs> needless to say, that did not go very far. Um, what, you know, any magic insights on how to deal with this? And, and then in particular, um, I think one of the things that we don't face, so question, this part two of the question is, how do we think about this, about the individual researcher? Like should, in terms of individual researchers, sometimes doing private science and sometimes doing public science, and how does, is that, is that a viable model to do both, or does that taint the entire portfolio for an individual? Well, this is something we've had a lot of panel discussions among economics, especially those of us who are using data from, you know, from Uber or from Microsoft or whatever. How do you think about um, the conflict issues and so on? I guess my personal view is that you know, we can't stop doing the research. Um, if we have to go where the data is, where the action is, we don't want to not study something really large like, say, Uber because we're worried about um, because we're, we're, we think those obstacles are insurmountable. So I think a lot of it has to do with being very clear about what you're doing, defining projects that are, that are credible, and making sure that you know, it, things can be, um, in some sense, you know, replicated in some way, whether you know, inside the firm they save the data set and with some cost people can get in to look at it, um, making sure that some level, you know, there's different types of credibility problems that you can come up with and thinking through what they are in a particular setting and making sure that they're addressed. And then I think in, in terms of, you know, the, the partnerships that we're forming, 
we really are you know, looking for people who are motivated by improving the space. You know, in the end, a great partner is someone who just wants ed tech to improve, that wants workforce training to improve. We look out and actually so many of these places, there's a lot of room and it's not like, you know, if this firm's market share goes up, this other one's going to go down in the same kind of way. Everybody's solving slightly different problems. And so there's a lot of opportunity to find social impact partners who are very excited to share their research. And, and putting aside the social impact, those are just great, those are the great kind of partners. Now, I think there's one bit of conflict of interest about just if what they want is an impact evaluation that says, you know, what, does this work or not? Obviously, there's an issue there uh, along that line, um, and you have to treat those kinds of impact evaluations a little bit differently. But if you want to show, does personalization work? In some sense, you know, the, the organization wants to know whether it works or not, and if you can show that personalization works, um, that's, a, I think, a, a credible thing. They're, they didn't have a vested interest in whether it worked or didn't. They want their product to work, but at some level, getting these insights about mechanisms and what types of things work um, is, is, is much easier and, and has less conflict. So I guess it's basically like managing those conflicts in a variety of ways. And I think one other slight point on that is that, you know, even before we had word about companies with this, you know, if you wanted to go work with a school district and measure something, well, it's going to be the high performing school districts that agree to be part of the study. Um, you know, it's the government, you're going to have selection of governments in terms of who agrees to work with you and you have to keep those partners happy. So in some sense, any time you work with the world, there are conflicts and so I guess I, my view is that what, what we need to do is just have a lot of integrity and transparency as researchers, but we can't just stop working on the world. Um, you know, that's, that's our job is to work on the world. Good note to end on too. Thank you both. Thank you, Susan. Thanks. Thank you, Josh.